to all the saints who are in Fallon and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> so last week I started our sermon series on Ephesians and I talked about the doctrine of election and how Paul's opening prayer told us that God has chosen us to be his own even before the creation of the world. Hopefully I explained it all well enough you found consolation in the doctrine of election, and if I didn't, I probably misrepresented something, so I apologize for that. Please come make an appointment in my office. We'll talk more about it. I apologize if I misled you. But I know last week I promised that then this week I would talk about the assurances we have so you can know that you are among the elect and you can find comfort in that doctrine as Paul continues on his theme of what it means to be brought into God's grace and granted a Christian identity. So let's dive into today's epistle reading. So in today's reading, Paul is expressly addressing the Gentiles of the church, which we should especially appreciate here, because aside from Loy and Caesar, who's 23 million years old, say 78% Jewish, I think, um, I'm guessing most of us are all Central European Gentile stock. So Paul is addressing one of those major controversies of the early church, that relationship between the Judaism that came before and the Christianity that is here now. Like I said in the children's message, many people thought that because Christ was the fulfillment of promises made to Abraham, you had to be a child of Abraham to fully receive all of the works of Christ. And so we see the rise of the Judaizers who insist that you have to convert to Judaism before you can convert to Christianity. Now the situation in Ephesus was not quite as bad as it is in Galatia, but there's still an issue of unity within the church there where Gentile Christians are still seen as less than the Jewish Christians. Paul makes reference to how they were called the uncircumcision, which was basically a racial slur against them denoting that they're not quite as good as those circumcised Jews following Jesus. Sort of a, yeah, okay, Timothy's a Christian, but Levi's a Christian who's been circumcised and still follows the kosher food law, so I think we all know who God likes more type of situations. <coughs> so Paul leans into it at the start. He admits there was a time when this division between Jew and Gentile made sense. In the past, the Gentiles were separated from God's covenant without any hope in the world because what hope can you have if God has not chosen you? Like I said in the children's message, those Gentiles back then did not get to sing that they were one of the many sons of Father Abraham. Israel was God's chosen nation, and they had specific orders not to intermingle with anyone else. Ezra even has this portion where he says that when the Jews came back from the Babylonian exile, they were ordered to divorce the foreign wives they had taken while they were away in order to keep the Israelite race pure, holy, and set apart for God. By the time we get to the Jews of Paul's day, they had grown up where the temple architecture literally had a wall separating the court of Israel from the court of the Gentiles. So only true Jews could go all the way into the court of the Israelites, and the Gentiles had to stay on the other side of the wall. They grew up with this separation ingrained in their very worship practices. So it's understandable that the people might have thought that this distinction still had to be made. Fortunately for all of us Gentiles here today, Paul does not leave us there. He isn't bringing all of this up in order to rub salt in the wounds or to say that the Jewish Christians are correct in voicing their superiority. <coughs> Rather, Paul is inviting the Gentiles to look at where they were before, strangers and aliens far away from Christ, <coughs> so that they can now fully appreciate the place to where they have now been brought. For by the blood of Jesus, the Gentiles are now brought into that exact same covenant with God that was available to the Jewish Christians. This idea of a wall separating Gentiles from Israel is rent asunder as surely as the temple curtain that separated God from Israel was torn at the crucifixion. Through Jesus, there is peace 
in the church. Out of the two peoples of Jew and Gentile, there is now one Christian. Not Jewish Christian, not Gentile Christian, just Christian. Reconciled to God through Christ's sacrifice with full access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. No longer are we strangers and aliens, but citizens and saints of the kingdom of heaven. All of us are now God's holy people, as surely as were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so at this point, I want to call attention to the fact that if you looked up today's reading in the Bible, not the one that they put in the bulletin, it actually starts with the word, therefore, which means we have to connect it to what came immediately before this portion. And that section that our lectionary skipped over between last week and this week is talking about how the whole church, Jew and Gentile, were all dead in the trespasses of their sin. Even the Jews who had that covenant with Abraham, they still needed forgiveness, and they were still powerless to help themselves. And now everyone in the church has been saved through the grace of God as a gift of his love and mercy freely poured out on those who could never earn it themselves regardless of their bloodline. Not by following the law, not by being able to claim Abraham as a father, but pure grace. And this leads to our favorite verse as Lutherans, not by works so that no one can boast. All of this comes together telling the entire church where we came from. So now we can all rejoice in our Christian identity, united in Christ's church, because that becomes the only marker that matters. It tells us that God doesn't give partial grace. He doesn't have a list and you get a percentage point for every box you can check off and reach certain levels of salvation. So, you know, Gentiles go to the fourth heaven, Jews get to go to the seventh heaven. It doesn't work like that. There's not a seniority system where I'm going to get four forgiveness points because I've been a lifelong Lutheran, but Walt's only going to get two because he converted as an adult. As one of my professors in seminary likes to say, Whenever God dispenses his grace, it's just a fire hose, full blast, all of it, without distinction. And he is lavish in dispensing his grace upon his church. And so all of us are brought fully into his favor. Now, everyone here today has witnessed a miracle this morning. You may not fully comprehend it by all outward appearances. It was not as dramatic as you might think a miracle should look. Loy has not thrown down his cane and begun cartwheeling down the aisle as his back pain has been healed. Sorry, Loy. I promise there's more than one communion wafer in there. I'm not expecting to multiply one to feed the whole congregation with enough to fill 12 baskets. But you did see someone rise from the dead. In the language of Ephesians, Lydia Morgana VR was dead in the trespasses of her sin. By very nature, a child of wrath. Yet even before the foundation of the world, the Lord God chose her in Christ, predestined for adoption as his daughter, to be holy and blameless, redeemed by his blood, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. None of it by her own doing or works, because honestly, she hasn't done much but eat and cry and poop so far. But she does do that very well. <laughs> All of this is a gift from God. Pure gospel promise contained in the waters of baptism, full blast from the fire hose of grace. And during that ride, I asked you to read along with it in your hymnal, and I hope that as you did that, you meditated on your own baptism and recognized how all of the promises given to Lydia today were also granted to you. For Paul tells us in Romans that while we were all of us dead in our trespasses, it was through baptism that we were raised up in Christ and given our identity as Christians. And this becomes that assurance I promised you, that you are among the elect. God's own child, I gladly say it. I am baptized into Christ. Because that's the beauty of the sacraments that God has given unto us. God's promises are tied to a physical object that we can personally experience for our own reassurances of God's grace. Because honestly, it might be somewhat nebulous and hard to pin down the exact moment you became a believer and found your faith, but you have your baptism, a concrete event with a specific date you can look at when you were officially declared to be reconciled to God 
and a member of his household. So as that water poured over your forehead, you, re forehead, you received that full blast from the fire hose of grace, regardless of whatever your background may have been, whatever the situation was, you became fully forgiven, fully alive in Christ, adopted by his love and mercy. When you confessed your sins this morning, and I declared in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ that your sins are forgiven, you got the fire hose of grace, full blast. You are kept as a child of God, wholly cleansed of the trespasses that would leave you dead, built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And in a few minutes, when you gather around the altar to partake in communion and receive the real presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will again receive that fire hose of grace, full blast, brought near by the blood of Christ, who removes that separation between man and God, that we might be reconciled, and that you might know his peace. And so just as Paul wrote to the Gentiles of Ephesus, I invite you to compare your past self to the new identity you have in Christ. To fully appreciate the gifts that have been given unto you, and in doing so, take comfort in the fact that through the assurances of baptism, absolution, and communion, you can know that you are no longer separated from God as you once were. <coughs> just as Lydia has now been called and adopted into God's family today, so too have you been called and adopted, reconciled to God, and given a guarantee of your inheritance. May peace be to you and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you are.